So some thanks, everyone, uh, for coming. Uh, yeah, I'll be talking briefly about uh, some of the work we have been doing on, on neural program synthesis. Uh, and actually, this is a joint work with lots of great colleagues from Microsoft Research, and now at Google Brain and DeepMind. Uh, so, so, so I think we've seen lots of uh, interesting motivation for why we would want to do program synthesis. Uh, I'll, I'll share slightly, slightly a little more personal one, but but we'll see how um, uh, that one. But but actually, uh, it's interesting to think about uh, the great progress we've seen in deep learning recently, uh, and and then we when we want to compare with let's say evolutionary progression uh, in humans, we see that when humans are born, uh, they get to see the world. Then they start saying things, and then they start saying things that make sense. So something similar, we've seen breakthrough, uh, breakthroughs in vision. Now, nowadays, we keep seeing new and new breakthroughs in speech and, 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 and newer models being developed for languages. Uh, so something similar, kids nowadays, after they learn how to speak, the next thing they do is programming. Uh, so here's my three-year-old niece writing Python programs. And so it's natural we should do we should build these kinds of models to do programming. Um, but but mo mo more seriously, actually, a lot of successes we've had in deep learning have mostly been on perceptual tasks, where system has to learn a pattern and do some kind of classification task. Whereas, actually, if we want to get towards general intelligence or, or towards uh, richer classes of tasks, we, we need to build systems that can learn to perform a sequence of tasks, uh, a sequence of actions like uh, algorithms, and programming languages are a great fit for it because it has the right sort of abstraction. It allows us to compose them, build these algorithms. Uh, so, so yeah. So, so the main motivation is if we can if we can train these systems to learn programs, we'll be able to do more complex set of things than than our current set of deep learning architectures can do. They also tend to generalize better. We have seen this also in many of the tasks earlier uh, talks earlier. Uh, since there's a prior coming in, we are learning programs. There's a strong prior coming in the programming language itself in terms of abstractions and kind of things that are allowed. So when we train something, they tend to do better on, on test set. Uh, and also there's this notion of interpretability where since we are going to learn programs, one can go in and hopefully understand those models better than, than just having a black box uh, set of weight, weight matrices. Uh, so, so, uh, so when we were trying to uh, chart out a vision about what would it mean to to uh, have some kind of a goal metric about uh, to to measure the progress we are making, so we we thought about what would be a good problem to target, and one of the things that came up was can we build a system uh, that can actually go into one of these programming contests and write programs uh, to uh, to do as good as humans, probably even better. Uh, so that's the longer term vision, and I'll, I'll report a little bit on the progress we have been making on this. Uh, but, but the nice thing was, so that would be the end goal, but along the way, uh, the hope is we would learn these interesting ways to represent programs in a distributed way uh, to be useful for many applications already, things like repairing a program that somebody might have written, uh, testing programs automatically, generating input, structured inputs, uh, or optimized programs. So if we take a step back and think about how humans are able to write programs, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, they can take a specification, uh, could be in many forms. They could have input output examples, test cases. It could be natural language, partial programs. Uh, they can take that kind of specification and write programs. And the way they do it is typically uh, these problems would require some kind of logic to, to, to solve the problem, uh, but it's not just the case that all programmers are great from the beginning. Uh, they take these programming courses, they start from basics, but then over time with experience, they keep on getting better and better. And, and nowadays also, a lot of code comes from outside. So, so, uh, so humans actually use various kinds of resources to, to, uh, to, to do these kinds of program, programmatic tasks. And the goal was, uh, what would it take to build a system uh, that can, that can uh, do similar things, but at the same time utilize these kinds of resources. Uh, so so I'll, I'll talk briefly now about some of the work we've been doing, but before that, uh, I wanted to make a slight distinction. I think we have seen uh, uh, some of the work uh, early in the morning as well, um, and I think Oriel also briefly mentioned this notion. Uh, 
So I'll try to make a small distinction between, I'll, I'll call this program induction, uh, may not be the best term, but let's call that program induction versus program synthesis. So, so, so high level idea in program induction is that uh, the network it, itself is the program. So, so one great example is this DNC work from DeepMind where uh, the idea was you have an LSTM controller which is, aug which, which is uh, augmented with some kind of differentiable memory with which you can read and write uh, in a differentiable way, and then this can be trained in an end-to-end -end fashion. There's lots of interesting work. One particular work that I uh, uh, particularly liked was this thing called Neural RAM, where you have a set of modules, and, and the goal is to come up with a gate, uh, come up with a circuit that satisfies some input, for example. And the main idea is uh, you define semantics for these uh, simple things in a differentiable way, such that you could do backprop. Uh, so, so actually, these are all interesting works, but but uh, uh, but the problem with these uh, all these approaches is that since the network itself is the program, it's hard to give any kind of guarantees. If 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 we train it on lists up to length 20, when we give it list of length 21, uh, they they tend not to work well. Secondly, they require lots of examples, training data to train. Uh, they are not interpretable because these at the end of the day these are just uh, a neural network. So, but, but in contrast, in synthesis, uh, instead of doing this, the idea would be instead of having a general network with some differentiable uh, 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 parameters, uh, what if, it, if we restrict the space of uh, programs to some functional abstractions, like a programming language, we say only these constructs are, are allowed. Uh, what if, if we do search on that? Uh, and, and, and since there's a prior coming in in the design of the language, they would tend to generalize better. But it still has downside. It still requires lots of data to do back propagation. Um, and it's also like single task learning. So, so that's where uh, most of my talk today would be about, uh, can, we, can we go towards a world where, like humans uh, or programmers, we, we don't require thousands of test cases before we start writing code. A uh, few test cases are actually more than enough for us to understand what's going on. So, so can we do program synthesis with, with very few examples and, and actually have stronger guarantees of what's coming out? So I'll start with uh, some of our uh, very initial work. Uh, Sumit mentioned uh, earlier in his talk, we did some work on flash fill earlier, where, where the idea was uh, people who are using Excel may not, may not know all the regular expressions or macros, uh, so it'd be hard for them to write programs. They can give examples, and the system can learn a program. Uh, and Sumit showed the language itself. I'm just showing it again to give a sense of this language is, you can think of it as a small functional language. At the top level, it's just a composition of functions. And every function is either a constant string or a substring. And substring is based on two regular expressions. Uh, so for example, let's say if this was my task, I wanted to format names like this. My program would be composition of four things. Uh, where F1 is essentially the regular expression for last word, followed by constant comma space, followed by uh, first character, followed by dot constant. So th this would be a program to do this task, but we don't want people to write such programs. We want people to just give examples and have the system produce the code. So that would be our synthesis task. Uh, but, but then, um, she, uh, so this system, and, and there's another system I'll show afterwards, they all have this general methodology which would be useful to look at now. So essentially what we do, we start with some domain-specific language or some kind of programming language for a given domain. Um, it could, you can think of it as like an Excel DSL or we'll see later on a Carol DSL. Uh, and, and now for doing training, um, we, we are going to take this approach. Uh, uh, and this is also something beautiful about programs compared to other domains. Uh, here we just we can sample lots of programs, as many programs as we want, millions of programs, and, and for every program we're going to generate a specification or examples, and and that would be our training data, uh, and then we will train these architectures to get a synthesis system out, uh, and and I was saying I think these are uh, these are the key properties of programs that enables us to do that. So programs have syntax, uh, they have semantics, so we can execute them and we can generate data. So to, to give a concrete example in the flash fill domain, we start with a programming language and then we, now we want to generate our training data. So, so here's a ram, random program we sample, which says get uh, the third alphanumeric string followed by 
uh, string starting from first colon followed by first four characters. So this is a random program we sampled. Then we generate a random input, uh, some string. We run the program to get output. So we generate five random inputs, run the program, get five out corresponding output, and this becomes our training tasks. So we have a program and five input output pairs. Similarly, we can sample even more complex programs. So here's a 10 length program, some random input, we generate output. So, so this would be essentially our training data. And uh, the system won't know anything about these symbols. So for example, it knows nothing about alpha, alphanumeric or even digit one. But from experience, after solving many tasks, it would learn interpretations or some kind of abstract semantics that would help it uh, in future generate programs from examples. So we're going to train it on synthetic data, uh, but to test it, if it has really learned the right thing, if it has really learned the right semantics, we are going to give it real data that users want to do in Excel, and then see if it can come up with the right program to do the task. Uh, so that would be our learning setting. And at high level, the architecture uh, would look something like this. We will have two, two, two uh, systems uh, in, in our architecture, one would be an example encoder that encodes the set of examples user has provided, and then we'll have a decoder that writes program, in this case, incrementally, one node at a time. Uh, and when one very high level way to think about this model is something like, you can think of programming language as some kind of a context-free grammar, and essentially the network is learning a search strategy over it. So it's learning at any time what is the rule to expand, and uh, uh, and what's the probability? So, so guide the search to 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 get to a program. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 so now our problem becomes something like this: um, we want to learn a function that takes a partial program tree and set of examples and expands the tree by one node at a time, and then you can apply this program iteratively to generate the full program. So there are two main challenges here. How do we represent programs in, in vector spaces? And how do we represent examples? And, and there are many, many design decisions. We'll see many different architectures. Uh, so this was the first one we came up with. Uh, the name would become slightly clear uh, in a bit. But, uh, but the high-level idea here was for our programming language, we'll first define some uh, embeddings for uh, uh, some, some vector representation for every rule and every symbol in the grammar. And then for every rule, we have two sets of uh, matrices. So for example, let's say this is our current parse tree, current program tree. Uh, we want to get a vector representation of this program. So we start with the leaf nodes. We do embeddings for the leaf symbols. Then we start using the first set of uh, matrices to go up the tree to find embeddings of parents given the children's embeddings. So this way we go up, we go all the way up to the root. Uh, so this is similar to uh, standard uh, recursive uh, RNNs. Um, but now we don't stop there because we want to learn which leaf to expand. So we do the second pass. So that's, that's what we call reverse recursive, where we start with the parent representation, in this case root, and now we compute chil updated children representations using the second set of matrices. Uh, so we go down the tree and all the way down, and now we get up, uh, new representations for the leaf nodes. And then we, we multiply them with, uh, we do dot product with all possible expansions and just uh, come up with a distribution of how likely it is for different leaf nodes to be expanded. Uh, one very interesting intuition here is that by doing this reverse pass, you would have noticed that now Every node knows about every node because there's a common path via root where the information is propagated. So that was actually quite interesting. Uh, and, and, and then we can train these tree decoders by doing uh, cross entropy with, with golden trees that, we, that I was showing you earlier, um, the synthetic data that we generate to train. Now, now, uh, now we want to condition this model with the examples that users have provided. So again, there are many choices. Uh, the one for this paper we were using was something called cross-correlation, where we, we have input-output strings. We run LSTMs over them to get last hidden state. And then we do this kind of uh, cross-alignment. So we, we, uh, we try all possible alignments and then do some kind of pooling to, to get a fixed length representation of the examples. And the intuition about doing this alignment was uh, that since Flashfill requires some notion of substring, 
So if we do this alignment, we can understand where, uh, which parts of input strings are common in the output strings. So this was all good, but uh, yeah. So, so then we tried seeing how well this does. On synthetic data, on small trees, up to 13 nodes in the AST, it does pretty well. Uh, it gets about 60% accuracy in, in the first prediction it makes. Uh, so this is another beautiful property of programs. Uh, let's say if I'm, if I'm doing a prediction on image labeling, I say cat, I can't do much. I, I can't see, evaluate if it's good or bad. Here, when I predict a program, I can actually run it on the examples and see at least it's consistent with that. If not, I can sample more programs. So, so here, 300 sample means I can take 300 programs and find one that is consistent with the test cases or examples users given. So it works pretty well, almost up to perfect accuracy, up, up to size 13. And when we go to real benchmarks, we, we find that actually up to size 13, it works pretty well even on the real benchmarks, uh, which was quite nice. So, so it seems like the training is being transferred quite nicely. Uh, the problem was we, can't really, uh, we couldn't really scale it up at that time at least. Uh, it was pretty difficult to bash these trees. Every tree was of different shape, partial tree, and then um, uh, scaling it up was difficult for larger, larger trees. Uh, but, but, but now we are trying to see uh, in different uh, other ways to, to frame this problem to make it more efficient. But at that time, it felt like, yeah, it, it worked okay, but not so great on, on larger programs. So then we took a step back, we said, uh, since trees are difficult to train, what if, if you think of programs as just sequences? So, so, uh, so you can think of program, uh, the, uh, the program and you flatten it out into a sequence. So here, uh, the basic architecture might look something like this. Uh, you have an LSTM that goes over the input string, which feeds into second LSTM for the output string, for the example, and then the final LSTM is for program decoder. We could add different kinds of attention. Uh, the one attention that worked well was the last one, which has double attention. When it's embedding the output string, it attends over input. And when it's producing the program, it attends over both input and output. So this was for one example, but we want people to give multiple examples. Uh, so, so the idea was quite simple. Uh, we, could, we, could, we could do the same thing for multiple examples, get latent space for programs, and then do some kind of pooling to generate a distribution over tokens uh, in the language. And the nice thing about this architecture was also it allowed for variable number of examples, unlike the previous work, which had only fixed number of examples. This system was working so well that we even went ahead and added new constructs in the DSL, uh, added all kinds of new functionalities. Uh, so this was something which was difficult to do in the previous version of FlashFill. Every time we would need to add a new operator, it would break down many of the assumptions and we'll have to come up with a new algorithm. But here, we can just generate more training data and train the system. Uh, and actually, another interesting part was this, this actually generalized quite well. It worked even better than the version we had done for uh, Excel. It, uh, the Excel version gets about 89% uh, generalization accuracy on, on, the, on the data set. This one got about 92%. And finally, it was quite nice also since it's, it's a, it's, 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 uh, it's a uh, statistical model. It can deal with noise. So even if people were making, uh, if we were making spelling mistakes, so we added some noise characters. Since flash fill was sound, uh, it would either fail or it would learn a wrong program. But this one could tolerate noise as well. It can learn programs that uh, work well. So before getting into too much details, uh, so this was, uh, we, we tried doing this for FlashFill. In the beginning, it was a functional language, and it, it worked quite nicely, a small subset. After that, uh, we started looking at, do similar techniques apply for Carol, which I'll briefly talk about. Uh, then we have been also looking at uh, uh, languages that have state, uh, where we have variables, and uh, we, we can read, read from the variables and write to variables and also some theoretical work on what is the class of programs that are learnable. And in terms of specification as well, I showed input examples, uh, but it could also be natural language and, and partial programs, and there's some work happening in that space. Uh, so, so just to uh, end, uh, I'll, I'll briefly talk about the second domain, which has similar properties. We want to see how similar uh, architectures actually generalize. 
So Carol is this small programming language that people at Stanford, uh, students at Stanford learn for their first introductory class. And, and the, and the, it's a small Turing complete language where there's a robot and it, it does some movements and puts and picks markers. So for example, for doing this task, students can write a small program to do this. And, and, and note that actually typically there would be multiple uh, examples of different shapes. So it can't be a straight line program. It, it has to have some kind of control flow. Uh, so, so this is a, a similar way. It's, it's, it's a small, concise DSL for Carol. It's interesting in the sense this has control flow. It has loops, conditions. So that was interesting level of complexity. Uh, and also the interesting part was since this is taught at Stanford, we can, we can actually see how well these systems do compared to students who are doing the same task in class tests and exams. Uh, so the architecture was quite similar as before, the encoder-decoder architecture. The only difference was instead of doing LSTM-based encoders, we use CNNs here because we made an assumption that in, in, uh, in the figures, there's actually some signal uh, system can learn that do I need a loop or not, or what kind of control structure I need from looking at the robot output. Uh, so we, we tried the same idea. We generated lots of programs uh, and trained the system. This was slightly more complex, as you can imagine. Uh, generating specification is slightly difficult, but it's manageable. So, so we could do that. Uh, one problem with program synthesis is that uh, since there can be multiple programs, and we are doing supervised learning, uh, so even though the model might be good, uh, but we are penalizing it, saying that no, make sure, make sure you always predict program A, even though program B might be OK. Um, so we wanted to see, can we somehow improve this problem. We, can we have a loss function that says any program is OK, as long as it's good with the test cases? So, so, but, but to do that analysis, we need an execution model, which is non-differentiable. So we had to do some form of reinforce here. Uh, but we can't train it from scratch, because the reward signal was very sparse. So we first train the supervised model, as we did for robust fill. Then we start sampling from the model. We run the programs. And then we give a simple reward uh, if the outputs are correct. Um, and it turns out actually doing this uh, improves by about 6 to 7% the accuracy. Then finally, uh, so the, the real test was actually what, uh, how, how does this do when we go to the class test? So we took 16 problems from last year's class test. And it got 43%, which was kind of surprising. I was expecting 0%. So, so this was interesting. Uh, it was able to do something, and this was one of the class test problems where students were given these two, uh, these input output, and uh, this was the program that was written by our system, which is quite sophisticated. It's, it's almost uh, 15, 16 lines, and uh, but 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 now the goal is actually can we bring that number up? Can we can we make it 100%? And uh, and we have tried lots of ideas, and it it, it seems completely neural techniques have some limitations. So the idea is, can we combine them with some more symbolic techniques to see if we can uh, scale this up? So this was pretty much it. Uh, uh, I wanted to uh, just talk uh, briefly about, uh, yeah, essentially, we, uh, programs are an excellent domain to, 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 be do, to be doing learning in, because they have all these beautiful properties of syntax, semantics, abstractions, composition. Uh, uh, so it's interesting from that perspective. Uh, and it's also interesting in terms of, uh, yeah, just trying out um, all different kinds of ways in which we can specify the task. Uh, so so the long-term goal is to, to build a system that can be as good as humans, or maybe complement humans to become, everybody to become super programmers. But along the way, uh, I didn't talk much about it, but uh, similar representations of programs or program embeddings could be used for other tasks like fixing bugs in programs or finding bugs or uh, doing other kinds of analysis aut automatically. So thank you. Any questions? I mentioned that there were some limitations to the pure neural approach. Could you share your intuitions of what these limitations are? 
Yeah, yeah. So, so limitation in the sense that, um, uh, or it could be that we haven't tried enough. But it was more in terms of we have tried many ideas, and it seems like uh, there could be an inherent uh, limitations in terms of for it to do these kinds of logical reasoning. That uh, just at the pure level, in the sense, if we say we want to go from this input to this output. And uh, for a human, it seems quite obvious that I should definitely do this, and this will happen. Uh, but then these networks uh, make uh, some kind of mistakes that they shouldn't make. Yeah. So, so the idea was, uh, can we somehow uh, add more, more symbolic reasoning that has more guarantees uh, to combine this with this kind of neural reasoning that guides the search? But, but yeah, it, it could also be the case, maybe there's certain kinds of architectures or ideas that we haven't yet tried, uh, and maybe that's, that's going to be enough, yeah. Oh, would, would you say that this is like in some way implementing constraints into these neural modules in order to get things that make, actually makes more sense? Uh, yeah, for, for future work, yeah. yeah. But, but, for, but currently we have just been, yeah, uh, doing uh, mostly end-to-end -end, um, uh, neural search.